Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the second video in the restoration series of this Blaupunkt Sultan. In the last video, I went through the power supply section. That was all done. And in this one, the primary focus is the audio. And in this case, audio is interesting because it's done by one tube. It's the magical ECL86. I've always actually been fascinated by this tube. Um, probably a little bit overtaxed because it's doing multiple jobs but um, it works and if it works and you can make it simpler with one tube why not so uh, that's what this is going to be all about i'm going to restore the entire audio section really starting at the input of the audio which will be the phono input that is the most direct audio connection into the radio phono input all the way through preamp tone controls tone shaping and everything else and then through the power tube transformer speakers so what i want to do is uh, feed a signal into the phono and make sure that it comes out the other side in pretty good shape. And I will show you at the end of the video what that shape is like. So if this sort of thing turns you on, stick around, enjoy the video. Before we carry on, I want to thank the sponsors of the video, PCBWay. You'll find them at PCBWay.com. These are the guys I go to for all my PCBs. And lately I've been looking at some of the other services they have, which are quite amazing. If you look at the products and capabilities page, you will be surprised. And I'm sure you'll find something for your needs. When you go to the details page for placing your order, you'll see all the options they have here, from uh, the size to the number of layers, to the type of material, thickness, and so on and so forth. Admittedly, I've used mostly the standards, but um, the one thing that I really like is some of the colors they have. This matte black I've used before, it really looks good. And especially if you use a particular surface finish, like Immersion Gold and Selective Gold, and they really do look great. So if you need any PCB work done, go to PCBWay.com. I'm sure you'll be satisfied. I want to get the mystery of those three different resistor values out of the way from the previous video. Now, I have three resistors that are in place, but they seem to be different values to what, uh, what shows up on the schematic. We see here that it's resistor 717, 711, and 707. And the values on the schematic 2.2, instead I'm measuring 1K, 4.7, I'm measuring 2.2K, and 33K, I'm measuring 22K. So it means that there is continuity, but the values are different to what I expect. And this is where this kind of uh, service manual really, really comes in handy. You see, you've got everything here. And this is the uh, ECH81. So we've got to sort of locate ourselves on the, on the chassis itself. So we're looking at this part over here is that part over there. That's the uh, tube socket for the ECH81. And here's one, 707. Here's 711. So 707, 711. Now 707 is supposed to be 33K. And what we actually have on there, it's, it's literally that greeny there. And it reads 22K on here. So this looks original to me. I'm trying to find other resistors. It looks like it's been there forever. And I also looked on the underside, the solder is not new or anything like that. So I'm going to presume that this is correct, that they changed something on a different version of the radio. So 707, we consider that to be okay. Then uh, 711, 711 is here. Now 711 is 2.2 we're measuring. We're supposed to have 4.7 according to the schematic. And 711 is down there. It's that red one down there, red, red, red. That's 2.2K, and that also seems to be an original resistor. There's no sign that it's ever moved from there. So again, I'm gonna presume that that is correct. So the schematic is different. So we'll call 71, yeah, 711 as being correct. Now 717 is the one we're measuring 1K. 717, we're measuring 1K, and it's that guy over there. We are measuring 1K, the schematic says 2.2K. So that one is over there. And as you can tell, I've replaced it. And why have I replaced it? Well, because what had happened is they tacked a resistor on the underside. Now, sneaky buggers, the resistor they tacked on the underside looked sort of of the same era. And it was indeed a 1K resistor, which is what we're measuring. But when I looked on the top side, I found the actual resistor completely burnt out. And it was so burnt out, you couldn't see the value. I replaced it with the 2.2, which is what the schematic says. But what I'm going to assume is that uh, they, that resistor burnt out. They didn't know what value to use. So they just put in a 1K on the underside, assuming. 
and correctly that the because the one above was completely burnt out it was an open circuit so that shouldn't be a problem so these guys over here can now be changed they can be replaced with uh, green 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 and i'm going to leave that question mark of well actually i'm going to leave the the notes on here anyway just in case they are incorrect but i'm going to replace those to green and i think the mystery of the resistor values is solved there we go now we know exactly what we've replaced on the schematic and if ever i need to go back and check values again i've got the note on the schematic all right let's move on as is obvious quite a bit has been done since the last clip the first thing i did was to remove the faceplate because I didn't want to risk it and also it helps me to get into some spots here to clean it up and also to remove the the pointer and the broken dial cord. I think I'll just cut this here. I've got the drawing on the service manual. I just don't want to lose this because this is intact and I'll do that later. We can see we've got a bit of a problem here. The actual backing plate here is cracked. This is a sort of a plastic and it broke over there, but I'm sure we can repair that. That shouldn't be an issue. I also had enormous difficulties removing the knobs. These knobs were really, really tight in here. I had to use the two teaspoon trick. And even then I was afraid that uh, I was putting too much pressure on the glass. So I ended up uh, spraying a bit of WD-40 from the top, put this, you know, face down left it uh, overnight and then again still wasn't easy but it, it actually happened it came out so there we are one of these sprang out but it's safely stored in the box there this one is also loose never mind i'll worry about that later what i wanted to do was to focus on the audio circuit and i found i'd left something out here that has to do with the actual power supply if you look carefully back there over there there is an electrolytic capacitor. Forget about this one for now. I'll tell you about this one in a minute. That electrolytic capacitor is part of the power supply. It actually filters part of the uh, B plus that comes through a resistor and then it filters, filters it. And that is what powers the uh, front end tubes just to make sure that it's ripple free and it's decoupled from the previous stage. So you don't get oscillations or any motor boating as they call it. So I had to do that. And why is it black? I mean, why is this one black as well? Um, I don't like putting normal capacitors in place of these because these capacitors, the ones that I've got, are actually radials. So these are the sort of capacitors I use. This is not a particularly good brand. It's not a bad one, but it's not a Nishikon or a Panasonic or anything like that. But um, I just want to use this as an example. This is a 100 microfarad capacitor, 100 microfarad, 50 volts. And in fact, this one, is what they use over here. The one they've got over there is actually a very small capacitor. It's um, four microfarads, is it? I believe it's four microfarads. The schematic will show us. Yes, it's capacitor 745. It's four microfarads at 350 volts. And as you can see, that comes from that second B plus that feeds the um, screen grid of the power tube. And then there's a 2.2K resistor and another capacitor. So you've got another sort of filtered stage which then is going to become the B plus for the more sensitive tubes, the non audio tubes. This is quite normal. You know, the more filtered it is, the less noise you're going to get introduced into your audio signal. So I decided to do that. And I, what I do is I don't want to put these guys in there because it looks bloody awful. And even if I got axials, you know, the ones with a lead on each end, I still think it looks too modern on these radios. Now, this is just, me being a little bit picky. So what I do is I uh, adjust this, I change this, and I'm going to show you again, somebody, well, actually more than one person has asked me how I do these. And I'm going to show you how I build this up to make it fit there and look a little bit more, well, I guess you could call it a little bit more vintage, a little bit more artisanal, handmade. It looks better than having something that um, sort of sticks out like a sore thumb on there. So let me show you how I build this up. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is to make this thing look less modern. And what I do is I take the negative lead. You can take either, but I like to take the negative because I then follow a, let's call it a routine, and there's less chance of me messing it up and getting confused as to which lead is which. And I'm going to extend the negative lead because this one is long enough. 
Actually, there's something else that I do that I can do right now. And that is, you see this lead is coming off on the one side. I want it to sort of come out the middle. So I'm going to just gently bend this in there. And I'm going to straighten it out so that it is sort of coming out the middle now. Okay, that's my positive lead. Now my negative lead is too short, so I'm going to extend it. And it's not complicated, very simple, just solder some wire on. I'll just tin a bit of this. And I use this uh, silver coated wire, any hookup wire, any wire will do really. Just get it, oh, this is tough. Actually, if I just tin this bit, I can actually then just hold it together. If you've got a bit of resistance to heat, you can probably hold it on long enough. Okay, that should do it. And now I'm going to put some heat shrink on. I'm going to put heat shrink on the leads, okay? And then I'm going to put a thicker heat shrink over the top. I'm just going to use the heat gun to crimp those. And we are done, okay? Now I'm going to find a bit of heat shrink that's going to allow, that's going to fit this section. This one should do. And what I need lengthwise is I want to, I want to let it sort of hang over the edge there because then it sort of pulls in, it shrinks in. So I want to leave about two millimeters on either side. I want to make it about four millimeters longer than the capacitor itself. So something like that. That should be good enough. Just put it over there. Same distance each way. Let it overhang and shrink it. And it's done. Okay. Now, this thing has got the red lead on here, but I'm going to put a pos positive sign here anyway. And I'm going to write what it is. This one is 100 microfarads at 50 volts. There we go. That's it. I, I like this better than having a, uh, a modern capacitor on one of these radios. It almost looks like it's been handmade. Well, <laughs> it sort of has. And I've used this a lot. I just prefer it. It makes absolutely no difference in terms of function, but it makes me feel better. So that's what I do with these capacitors. This one I've got no use for. I'll just save it for the next radio. The next logical step is the audio section. And as I mentioned, the audio section is based on one tube. And then all the other stuff is, um, a lot of the other stuff is uh, the tonal and, and volume control and everything else. So this tube is the uh, ECL86 and it has the preamp section. And if we look at it here, you can obviously see that a lot of painting has happened. Here's the preamp section and here's the power amp section. Now this happens to be in the same tube. So you've got uh, two functions in one. This is quite normal. There are a lot of tubes that have different types of functions. They make the tube a lot more useful. And what I've done is I've uh, actually went backwards. I didn't go forwards, I went backwards. So starting up here, I checked all this, replaced that capacitor, checked every resistor, Next stage was this part over here, which is the, the cathode circuit of the power section of that tube. That capacitor was changed, swapped out. That's that guy over there, 100 microfarads. And of course, marked it in here is red. And uh, then I went backwards through here. And all the capacitors that I believe needed changing were changed, like that one, that one. All these were checked. This uh, this is the uh, treble pot. It basically takes a signal and bleeds some of the high frequencies off to ground. This thing is not wired like this. For some strange reason, this is actually connected to ground, which is a bit strange. But um, I corrected or made this change on the schematic so that we can see where the changes happen. And then uh, what else do we have? So this is the power tube and it gets fed by the uh, anode of this triode in, in the triode section, in the other section. And that's where the low level audio gets fed in. This thing is biased, not with a cathode circuit like this one, but rather with a very, very high resistor, 10 mega ohms. 
And what happens here is that some of the electrons that get shot off actually flow. And because they're very, it's a very low current, but because this is such a high uh, impedance, such a high resistance, low current crossing a high resistive value gives you a reasonably high voltage to bias this tube properly. And the input of that is actually through this capacitor. This is the sort of capacitor that very often needs changing, as is that one there. And you can imagine that if you've got like 150 volts on here and you need zero volts on here, this thing must stop DC very well. And that's where the leakage happens a lot and it can blow your tube or your output transformer. So these capacitors are very important to look at. And here's the other one. And this comes from the uh, volume pot wiper. The volume pot wiper is connected to ground on this end. And the signal that's coming into here is really the source of all audio. I didn't mark this, but this one's been changed as well. I, I should, I've got to mark this in red. This one's changed as well. And then this comes from the switch, which selects between the phono input, which is these two guys, or radio, which is from that side, from that end. And that there, which will change between AM or FM. So what, I'm, uh, what my intention was, was to check the entire circuit to the point where I could input a uh, tone up here and it would go through the whole thing. This is the bass control, obviously. And then we'd hear this or get this going through to the speaker. This here, this part here, is actually the feedback circuit. It comes from the output, from the speaker, it comes through there. And there are a few switches over here which allow different frequencies to be fed back to the volume circuit, to part of the volume control circuit, and act as a negative feedback for certain frequencies. And depending on the switches, now this one, like this one would be, I think this would be pickup, and this would be the FM switch. So if you've got FM, you probably want more hi-fi. You don't want uh, a lot of negative feedback on the high frequencies. So that would be deactivated, things like that. So that gets fed back to I. Where is I? I is up here. OK, so I've explained some of these feedback circuits in depth on a lot of uh, previous videos. So I'm not going to go too much into that. But as you can see, we've got um, this one here, which I forgot to paint. So one, two, three, four. Oh, I've talked about that. That's a power supply. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is about it. Now, about this this capacitor over here. That is this capacitor here. Now, this looks strange because it's actually two capacitors. I wanted a one thousand volt capacitor, and I didn't have a thousand volt at uh, 4.7 nanofarads. So what I did is I used uh, high voltage capacitors in series, 10 nanofarads. Put two in series, you get five. It's close enough to 4.7. And the reason this has got to be a thousand volts rather than the normal B plus level is that it is in a circuit. It's in the circuit that is reacting to the transformer. This transformer here, because of the inductance of the of a transformer coil. This actually hits voltages that can be way, way higher at this point than the actual B+. So you want to make sure you've got a thousand a high voltage capacitor there. It uh, actually acts as the feed to the electrostatic tweeters. OK, and the reason I know it's a 1000 uh, volt is you see this uh, symbol. It's got two little dots on here. And if you go down, looking at this part of the schematic, you can see what the different symbols mean. And each of those components on there has different symbols. If it's normal like this, this is less than or equal to 350 volts. If it's got one dot, it's a 500 volt. If it's got two dots, it's a thousand volts. Again, with the resistors, you've got different uh, power ratings. You can see that if you've got these three little balls in there, it's a three watt resistor. If there's nothing, it's one watt and so on and so forth. So again, these uh, service sheets are incredible in that they give you an enormous amount of information. So after all is said and done, I've got everything done and on the audio section, and I've made the appropriate markings on the schematic. You can't see that much. You see, that's one there. There's another one back there. But the majority of them are actually on the, uh, the board that holds the volume control. So it's actually that board over here. 
You can see all the, the capacitors over there. The resistors were checked. The volume control was uh, suitably cleaned with contact cleaner to get rid of all the gunk on the volume control itself. We may have to do some more when we do the testing. I'll certainly have to clean these tone controls again, but I wanted to get all the circuitry done, all the replacements done, so that I can finally get uh, this thing ready to test. And one of the things you've got to be very careful about cleaning are the pins in the tube sockets. These things can actually get really gunked up and they can really mess you up because you think you're, uh, you've got a problem and it's actually just a contact problem. And the best thing to do for that is to use one of these. These are those dental cleaning brushes or I don't know what you call them, thingies. You can get various sizes and I just put some IPA on there and clean the, these one at a time. Take your time. That's the idea. This is a hobby. If you're charging a client by the hour, you've got a problem. <laughs> so once these are cleaned, you can then clean the actual uh, pins on the tube as well with a little wire brush or something. And the tube can go in there. Obviously, you need to do a better job than I'm doing, which means you come back a few times. But it really does a great job. These things are amazing. You get various thicknesses. So I've got a few sizes. This is the one that works best here. So there we go. And uh, I've also cleaned part of the board. And this section of the board is all being cleaned up. And the way I did that was with my uh, airbrush compressor with IPA in there. And I just spray it on. I use the brush to, to, to brush it and I just put it vertically so that all the runoff comes down to the bottom. And that way you get rid of all the dirt. You don't have to actually sit there with cotton swabs or anything like that. And it looks pretty good. So I think we're about ready to test this. I'm going to put the tube in. I've got spares, but I'm going to try it with the original tube. See if it's any good. It might not be, but it, we'll give it a try. What am I going to do here? I want to feed an audio signal in from the signal generator to the most direct audio route that I can find. And that is the phono input here. Now, this uh, five pin DIN socket, you can see it on the schematic. The middle one is ground. The two sides or two to the side are shorted together. That's the phono and the other side is for tape out. I'm not interested in tape out. I just want to set uh, feed a signal in here that is effectively into the phono input. I've had one of these sockets wired these are the wires that I need to connect and I can plug that in there. And now I just connect my signal generator to ground to there and the signal to the, those two pins over there, to those wires over there. I'll connect the speakers. We'll uh, monitor the signal on the scope as well and see if we're getting any sound from this thing. Right, this is the setup. I've got this connected to the dim bulb. It is on or rather it's on limit. I've got all those off. I'm going to use the uh, 40 watt light bulb only. I've already selected pickup on the radio, so I'll be switching it on with this. I have the transformer in place. It's plugged in there. It's going to sit on the side here like that. Not a problem. Signal generator is producing a one kilohertz tone, which comes out here. That tone goes into the back here, into the pickup input. Speaker output is going into my workshop speaker here. I've got speaker selected. I've got that monitoring that output, which will give us the display on the scope, which I'm going to get on my computer so I can do a screenshot and we can see everything that happens. There's my pickup selected. Volume is on max. The amplitude of the signal generator is 100 millivolts RMS. And I think we're ready to go. Let me hit the on button. Oh, no fireworks. That's good. Bit of time for the uh, tube to warm up. Still can't hear anything. I had the wrong button on there. I had an internal amp. That is very low. This thing needs more. Okay, this needs 400 millivolts RMS. Change the scope range. No, this is very weak. This is very, very weak. I think that tube might be knackered, so I'm going to replace the tube. Let me just put that off. 
that's the problem with having one tube. It does all the work, so it obviously can wear out. Let's try with a brand new ECL86. See if we get lucky. And I've also got massive restriction on the on the supply. There's only a 40 watt light bulb. Oh, that level's too high. It's actually clipping. Okay, let me put it on dummy load so we don't have to listen to it. Look at that. Look at that. Let's see where it starts clipping. Okay, I'm carrying on. I'm watching the voltage. That's on maximum volume over here. And it's still not clipping, so I'm going to take that up to 500 millivolts RMS, 600 millivolts RMS. Let me come down a bit because now it is clipping or distorting. It's still distorted, but you see that starts distorting in a roundabout way. It's not sharp. It's the whole point of tube sound. I would say that is probably where you'd call what you'd call acceptable distortion. One of these has three volts, three volts RMS. That's 9 divided by just over 1 watt. This is the big irony of these things. They tell you a certain wattage and I've never been able to get it. That would sound good, although it is distorted. If I wanted to get a clean sine wave, I'd probably be down here. Let me get a better view. Yeah, that's, that's a clean issue. So that's a clean sine wave. That's 2 volts, 2.2 volts RMS. Now that is with... Let me drop that because that is with full restriction and the light bulb is glowing. So the radio is only seeing 190 volts. Now, if I give it another light bulb, you'll see what happens to that. It goes up a bit more. Another light bulb. In fact, I'm going to bypass the dim bulb. So now we've got full 220, 226, 227 volts going in there. 230 volts, say. And now... Now it goes up to about 3.7 volts before it becomes obviously rounded. That's great. And I'm not hearing, actually I'm not hearing anything because I've got this on dummy load. But I'm not hearing any scratches. Let's try the tone control. There's a bit of noise there. That is needs a bit of cleaning and that one oh that definitely needs cleaning so i'm going to cl clean those spots and i think we're good to go brilliant put that on dummy load again brilliant i think we're good so the entire audio section of this has now been checked and tested and is working perfectly as i said you never get I never seem to get the uh, power output that these guys say you should. I think maybe they drive this into massive distortion, which they considered acceptable, and then they tell you you get 3 point something watts. I mean, over there, we're talking about one watt. And believe me, when this thing is played through sensitive speakers, and the speakers this, these, these radios have are very, very sensitive, it's more than enough volume, as you'll hear when we finally test this uh, in the cabinet and everything else. So I'm very happy with progress so far. And I now have to focus on the radio sections. Remember, we've only tested this with one tube. I mean, the magic eye is there, but it's doing nothing at the moment. But this thing has done nothing as a radio. It's acted as an amplifier. That's all it is. It's an amplifier. And uh, I want to go now to the next stage, which is uh, put in the other tubes, see whether we get AM, see if we get FM. But that's what I'm going to do in the next video. So for now, that's where I'm going to leave you. And I hope you've enjoyed that. And if you have, click like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon and PayPal. Links are in the description below. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.